Hey guys, this is Mitch with Fine Point CGI, and today I want to talk to you guys about the new dev snapshot for Godot 3.4. You heard me right, we're going to be doing a Godot 3.4. Now, this is the beta 2, and again, you heard me right, a beta 2. Uh, they didn't even really announce a beta 1 for this, so it's kind of exciting to see that there is a beta 2 already. So, if we want to talk about some of the highlights, uh, they had some C-sharp fixes, a couple of animation fixes. Um, they did some delta smoothing options. They added additional uh, crypto stuff. So AES context, HMC, HMAC context, RSA, public keys, encryption and decryption, and sign and verify. Um, they did overhaul a little bit of the editor's theme to help improve the user's experience. And they did do some HTML5 stuff like progressive web app support and uh, implementing Godot to JavaScript interface, which I will be making a video on for you guys in the future. I think that'd be a really cool topic to cover. Now, they also added in some lossless encoding. They did some Mac OS fixes um, and they did some GL uh, TIFF module scene export stuff. Um, but the really the big one of all of the things is the ability to do occlusion calling. Now, what is occlusion calling? Well, occlusion calling is the ability to call out objects that are not seen by the camera. So beforehand, Godot had no way to occlude objects that were not in the frame when you were playing your game. So your, your system is running and rendering all of that stuff that's uh, not necessarily getting seen by your uh, user. So this is a huge step forward for Godot in terms of 3D development. Now, one of the cool things about our little 3.4 announcement here is they gave us a web-based version that we can go and mess around with. So if you scroll up to the top, uh, right about here, and you go ahead and click right here, you can just click right here and it'll go ahead and allow you to play with the new beta version. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the Godot editor and we're gonna go ahead and take a look at these occlusion calling, um, this new occlusion calling edition. You can see the two projects here that I was playing around with it, trying to learn how it worked, but let's go ahead and make a new project and let's call it, um, uh, I guess announcement, it's not really a tutorial. So this is going to be subject to change. Um, they may change how this works. So this is not by any means a comprehensive analysis on how this is going to work. So first what we're going to do is we'll open up a 3d scene. We're going to right click and add in a child node, and we are going to add in a CSG box here, and we're going to duplicate that box. And I'm going to drag this box over here somewhere like this. I'm gonna right click up here and add in another child node and I'm gonna grab in a combiner. I'm gonna duplicate that combiner. I'm gonna grab this box, put it underneath here, grab this box, put it underneath it here. I'm gonna duplicate my new CSG box here and I am going to scale these down like so. I'm going to bring this up and I am going to go ahead and do a subtraction. Now, if you guys don't know what I'm doing, um, CSG meshes are used for quickly boxing out a level. So that's what I'm doing here. And actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this and I'm going to make this box a little bigger. So it basically just allows you to create a much bigger, or it allows you to design out a level and uh, prototype it out before you commit to how it's designed. So it's a really cool little system. And I have a tutorial on this. Um, I just need to release it. So I think I'll probably end up releasing it as maybe like a Saturday tutorial or something like that. Cause I know that I've been really busy with other tutorials. So I haven't really had time to, uh, build this out. Now I don't like how this is doing this. So let me, ah, goodness, causing myself some trouble here. Let me, um, go in here, go to my transform. Let's reset that to the center. Let's, uh, change this so that this is out here put my csg box in here and let me control duplicate this actually before i control duplicate this let me pull this out and i'm sorry i know i'm going pretty quick but this isn't really supposed to be a formal tutorial it's just me demoing the uh, occlusion calling system so 
I'm not really focusing on explaining how this all works. Um, but I'm going to grab this and I am going to get it a subtraction and I'm gonna pull this up. So now we've got some floor here. I'm gonna duplicate it. And then we are going to scale this down and pull this forward. And then we're gonna do the same thing here. So control D and put it like this and then drag it through. There we go, nice and simple. So we got two rooms that are very basic. Now, what also I'm gonna do in the spirit of all of this is I'm gonna right click add an HCSG box and I am going to scale it down and make it nice and small, providing that I can. Here, let's do this. And I know you're not supposed to scale CSG meshes, but that's okay. I mean, I'm not gonna be doing it for any kind of level design stuff, so it should be fine. So I'm gonna drag this over here. I'm going to duplicate it, put it over here, duplicate it, put it, um, I don't know, over here, let's say, and duplicate it and put it over here. And then I'm gonna grab these, I'm gonna duplicate those, and I'm gonna put them in this room as well. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna give me some things so I can show you how occlusion calling works and what its benefits are for us. So now that I have all of this, these four I know are here and these four I know are on this side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to right click, add in a child node, and we're gonna go ahead and add in, if we go down to spatial, and we scroll down and we go into a room manager. So with Godot 3.4, we have four, well, we have multiple new nodes, but the four that I'm gonna be talking about is the portal, the room, the room group, and the room manager. So what are these and how do they work? So the room manager handles all of the occlusion calling. It handles all of how it operates. It calls all the objects and it handles all that stuff. The room group groups rooms together so you can have common functionality between rooms. And what is a room, you might be asking. Well, a room is a node that has a bunch of objects together. So that way you can call out your objects. So you, you say these objects are together as one unit. So if the user is not in that room, that room can be called out and be hidden from the user's view. And finally, we have a portal. And what does a portal do? Well, it allows you to look between two different rooms. Okay. And one of the things that you have to know is portals need to be um, the same name with a star or else it doesn't work. Now, and I'll show you kind of what I'm talking about in a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag in ourselves a little room manager and you'll see here it says, hey, um, a room list has not been assigned. Well, what is a room list, right? Well, if you scroll up here and you right click on your spatial node and you add in a child node and you open up your spatial nodes, you'll notice that a room list does not exist. And the reason why it doesn't exist is because it's just a spatial node. It is just a regular node. As long as it inherits from node, you're good to go. So we'll go ahead and put a spatial node in. So now that we have a spatial node here, what we need to do is we need to create rooms for the spatial node. So let's go ahead and right click. Actually, I think I can just right click on this. So let's right click on our spatial node, add a child node, go to our spatial node, scroll down to a room, and let's go ahead and add a room. Now, what is a room? Well, right now the room is nothing. There's nothing in here. And the only way that it's gonna work is if you drag in objects into that room. So let's go ahead and select our CSG combiner and drag this down and into this room. Now you'll notice that when I click on this, the room has expanded from that little tiny box to the entire bounds of this object, right? So it's treating this object as one big room. And you can actually have subrooms. You could have a room inside of another room that's inside of another room and it'll call them as you would expect. So if the person's not looking at that room, it would just call it. So now that we have a little room right here, let's go ahead and create another room. So let's right click on our spatial node and I'm just gonna type room since now we know where it's at. We're gonna throw a room in here and then I'm gonna go ahead and grab our CSG combiner. I'm gonna drag this down into room two and there we go. So now if we click on our room manager and we know that our room manager is looking for a room list, if we come over here, there's a section called room list under main here. We have whether or not it's active and the room list it's looking for. And like I said earlier, room list can be whatever we want it to be. So let's go ahead and click on assign 
and then just go ahead and click on our spatial node here. If we hit OK and we click Convert Rooms here, you'll see that we get a missed named nodes detected. Check Output Log for details. So if we click OK, why did that blow up? Rooms have a very specific naming convention you have to follow. So if I call this room underscore one, and I call this one room underscore two, and then I come back to room manage and I click convert rooms, you'll see suddenly it worked. So if I'm in here, you can see here's a room and I come in here and here's a room. So now our occlusion calling is in fact working, see? Which is great, that's exactly what we wanted. But our uh, objects are no longer here, right? That's because they're not in our room. So if we go ahead and we select the first four objects, right? You can see their outlines here. If I select these first four objects and I throw them into room one, and then I click on our room manager and I click convert rooms, you'll notice that our objects has shown up. And we can do the same thing on the other side if we drag these in to our room two, and then we click on our room manager and convert rooms, and we go into that room, you'll see that those objects are in fact there. See? Now, if we wanna see our entire level, just go ahead and hit the active checkbox here, and everything shows up, see? And uh, if we wanna see it, we just make sure we have it checked. PVS. is a calculation system that allows you to determine if an object is visible. So you can either do the partial, disabled, or full. A partial is generally what you want, but you can do full if you would like, but you don't have to. You have gameplay monitor, and this will uh, give out events for you to subscribe to so that you can do things like shut off AI or shut off animations or something like that. That's what this is for. Use secondary PVs just uses a secondary PV mode. So it does a second check. Use signals. It'll actually broadcast a signal um, that you can subscribe to. So if I come up here to my nodes, you can see gameplay entered, gameplay exit, and visibility changed. So you can actually subscribe to these little signals here and you can fire them off to do different events. Now, what would you want to do here? Well, if the visibility changed, let's say that, uh, you know, the visibility changed and it sends out like what object was, what uh, room was hidden, you could go into that room and say, okay, this room's been hidden. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hide, or I'm gonna go ahead and shut off all these elements from processing, right? I don't need my player to have AI running Right, or I don't have a, I don't need to have AI running if my player isn't in that room. Right, there's no reason for them to see it. Right, if I have a radio running, right, and running a for loop, right, I don't need it to do that necessarily. Right, so I could shut it off by subscribing to this event or to subscribe to the signal. Now, if we go back to our inspector and we come down to optimize, you can do what's called merge meshes, and what merge meshes do or does is it merges your meshes into one static mesh. So what'll happen is, is it'll take all of these objects and combine them into one. That way you can um, treat it as one big chunk when you're rendering it instead of rendering it as separate objects. It's super memory efficient and it's a good option to turn on. Remove danglers just removes external you know, dangling objects and it just optimizes your scene. Then we got some debugging stuff and we have our advanced stuff and advanced stuff. I don't really want to get into too much, but basically it's just for portals and things like that. Now in the debugging section, you can actually show debug and hide debug, which will just show a debugging layer or hide a debugging layer, show margins and hide margins shows the margins between objects. Debug sprawl will debug. It will show you like a little debug sprawl. So you can see all the little objects and stuff like that as wireframes and things like that. Overlap warning will show you if objects are overlapping. It'll say, hey, this is overlapping. It'll highlight it red. Now here's where the magic is, preview camera. So if I right click on my spatial node and I add in a child node and I add in a camera, okay? Now I have a camera in this scene right here. I click on my room manager and I come down here and I assign my preview camera and I click on camera. You will notice suddenly Two of the objects has disappeared. You see that? 
If I rotate this, you'll see that this object here is disappearing. If I rotate the camera more, you'll notice that the objects are disappearing and appearing. And this is what's called occlusion calling. It's actually, this is actually called frustum calling or frustum, depends on who you are, I guess, uh, calling. And what that means is when it's out of the view of the player, it gets called out. And then occlusion calling is something similar, but instead it's objects that are behind other objects. So now the question is, if we look at this, right, the camera can see into the scene here. But if you look at it through preview, it's gone. It doesn't exist. This is where portals come in handy. So what is a portal? Well, basically a portal is a doorway into another room. It's a way to look and see another room. So if I right click my room and I add in a child note and I add in a portal, you will see this really fancy looking little plane here. What you want to do is you want to rotate it until that plane is pointing towards your camera here. And we'll move this back until it's about flush with the center of the thing. As long as it's this little bounding box is in here, we should be good to go. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go portal underscore one, and I'm going to duplicate this portal and I'm going to move it into room two and I'm going to call it, or I'm sorry, I'm not going to call it portal one. Let me click on portal and let me just go to linked room and assign it to my room, room one. And there we go. It'll, or it'll just assign it automatically. And then we'll do this and we'll assign and we'll go to room two and we'll change this to portal two. Awesome. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this portal like this. And then I am going to go ahead and do camera or I'm sorry, not camera, uh, room manager, convert rooms. Okay, and you'll see that that did not work. And why didn't it work, right? And I'm sorry for the lag, my computer's being kind of funky, but why did this not work? Well, if you come down here and you see how we named this portal two, well, the system doesn't know how to link these items together. So we need to create a linking between the two portals. So how do we do that? Well, if you backspace the, the name of this and go to one, and you go wild card, so uh, shift eight or star, and we go one and we hit enter. And if I scroll up here and I go to my room manager and I go ahead and convert my rooms, you'll notice suddenly it seems like everything didn't change. It didn't do anything. But if I come down here to my camera, and I click on it. If I go ahead and rotate my camera, you'll notice that it calls out that entire room and you'll notice that my performance suddenly got way better as well. Now, one of the things that I've noticed is uh, the web version of Godot is very much slower than the normal version of Godot, but you can see that if I rotate this, how it starts calling out the objects that it can't see until it's called them all out. See that? Awesome. So that's the basics of this new feature. And it's really fascinating and fantastic for what we, um, for the 3D side of Godot. So it's something that it's a long awaited feature that really is going to help change the landscape of Godot. But anyway, guys, that's really all I have for you guys today. So if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. Hey, you know, if you dislike this video, go ahead and hit that dislike button because I am here to make content for you guys. Now, Godot 3.4 has not released yet, but when it does, I will be covering it more in depth once that happens. But anyway, that's all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much again for watching, and I will see you all next time. Thanks. Thanks.